Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder in the Day Week in Review, where we will be discussing and reviewing the last seven founders from Founder of the Day, both here on YouTube and on the website Founder of the Day, where I publish articles as such. Uh, thank you for coming. As we mentioned last week, uh, for trivia tomorrow, we are going to be doing it a little bit differently, so you should definitely pay attention to this particular episode. Now, uh, I did not shrink my head. I did get a haircut, and also, I'm all the way over here because, well... We're popping up our founders over here. First one is Cato. We have started a new anti-federalist this week, uh, Cato. And while we have not gotten into the uh, papers of Cato quite yet, uh, the first, as always, was a preview for what's coming up, or an introduction, as it says next to me. Uh, so a little background. Cato is one of the first people to start writing anti-federalist papers right after the Constitution is printed. The first one is published this, uh, September 26th. Nine days after the Constitution was signed, let alone printed and sent out for people to read, Cato was ready for it. Uh, he would publish a series of seven articles from that September to the following January, 1788, uh, published in the New York Journal and Daily Patriotic Register. And that is the full title. It's not two different papers. The and in there is just part of it. Uh, that being said, we are, of course, like with most anti-federalists, not entirely sure who the author was, though historians generally have agreed that it was probably Governor George Clinton of New York. Uh, these were being published in New York. New York is a hot bed of anti-federalist anti publications, though of course they were printed elsewhere. Uh, there are some historians who argue it probably it might not have been George Clinton, but most historians agree it was more than likely George Clinton who was publishing the papers of Cato. And again, we're not going to get too much into the papers yet, but I do want to note George Clinton was the longest serving, is still to this day, the longest serving tenured governor of the state of New York. Wink, wink, for those who plan trivia tomorrow. Uh, he did have a little bit of advanced knowledge of what was going on at the Constitutional Convention because when John Lansing and Robert Yates left the Constitutional Convention, they went back to New York and they met with Governor uh, Clinton and probably told him some things that they weren't really supposed to tell him. So he was ready to go. Uh, and what's really different about Clinton is, or I'm sorry, Cato, is Cato uh, focuses on the presidency a lot, we can expect. As opposed to other anti-federalists who focused on the House or the lack of a Bill of Rights or things of that nature, Cato was one of the only ones who really focused on the power of the presidency. Uh, additionally, if it was George Clinton, which again it probably was, he uh, he might not have liked the Constitution, but he would later go on to be the fourth Vice President of the United States of America. So there's that. Um, that. And that's pretty much it for Cato. So let's get on into the Founders. Actually, I forgot. Uh... Two of today's discussions are going to be about the burning of cities. I did this one, and then the next day I was like, let's talk about another city that lit on fire. So not a particular founder this week, a little bit different, but that's okay. It's still a lot of fun, and we're still going to do it. So first of all, we're going to talk about the burning of Falmouth. Now, Falmouth, Massachusetts, as it was known at the time, we know now today as Portland, Maine. Almost said Oregon. No, Portland, Maine. I understand Portland, Oregon was settled by people from... Portland, Maine, and it was named after that. A lot of Western towns that have similar names to Eastern towns are basically people who moved and just kept the name of their town. Though to be fair, a lot of town names on the East Coast are just named after the places in England or Europe that people moved from. So the chain goes on. Now, as for Falmouth, I call it Mawet's Revenge because there was a, a, a captain of a fleet named Henry Mawet. We actually discussed Last week, uh, Samuel Thompson's war, how Samuel Thompson was able to take uh, a few, a ship had sailed into Portsmouth Harbor, wanted to unload goods, but Thompson was enforcing the boycott of the First Continental Congress. Uh, then a ship shows up with the captain. They kidnapped the captain uh, and held him hostage and said, you guys can leave as long as you leave without unloading any of the cargo on the ship. And they did. And that captain's name was Henry Mowat. And six months later, five months later, Henry Mowat comes back to Falmouth, Massachusetts, this time with a whole fleet of ships, five ships to be exact. And he says, hey, send me gunpowder, uh, give me some weapons, and 
give me some hostages. I want some of those people that had kept me hostage last year. Send them out to me. If you don't, we're going to shell the town, blast it to bits as it were. So they do this. Uh, well, actually, they don't do this. What the Patriots say is, well, there are women and children in this town. So give us give us some time to get them out, okay? And Mawet was a gentleman. And he said, sure, I give you 48 hours. Uh, two days later, at 9 a.m. in the morning, he starts blasting the town with cannon fire. It ends up destroying a big portion of the town. And Mawat then actually sends out soldiers, marines, to burn the town. Now, the Patriots, though they were vastly outnumbered, did have a little bit of militia there. And they returned fire when the, the British were attempting to burn the city. And they did kill one and wound another British soldier, uh, who then get back on the boat. Actually, uh, Marines. So they were actually in the Navy. Instead of calling them soldiers, I should call them Marines to be efficient and correct. Uh, the rest of the Marines go back, and Mawet does leave. However, the city had burned uh, about a third of it, which left about uh, 300 families, I believe the number was. At least, oh, 300 buildings, maybe even 400 buildings, have been destroyed in these engagements. Not great for the citizens living in the area, especially because Maine winter was about to set in. They send word to the uh, Continental Army, which at this point in 1775 was stationed outside of Boston. And this is uh, uh, in 70, this is well before independence had been declared. Uh, but the army is sieging Boston. They send word to George Washington and say, hey, please help us. Can you send us anything? Uh, at this point, several men who were from Falmouth requested leave to go home. Uh, ben Franklin would later call this too reasonable a request to be denied. And they were permitted to go home. This struck a humongous fear in the hearts of the leaders of the revolution because there was a justifiable fear that the British would simply sail their giant navy up and down the coast, burning cities and shelling cities from the water. It would have been a, probably a really... Could have been a tactic that worked very well, a good strategy. Uh, they don't end up doing that too often. They do it from time to time, but not as their main strategy. Uh, fortunately for the Patriots, now, either way, there was a contingent, a, a delegation had been sent to George Washington just as this happens, which uh, consisted of Ben Franklin, Benjamin Harrison, and Thomas Lynch. They were there to see how the Continental Congress could help the Continental Army win the war. They end up returning to... Philadelphia and saying, you know what they need is a Navy because the British Navy is going to be a problem. And it was about a month later that the uh, Continental Navy was first created and in large part to the sufferings of Falmouth. Uh, because in addition to not only destroying cities had they been firing from the sea, uh, many other soldiers would have had to request to go home to help feed and shelter their families that had just been destroyed. Their lives had been destroyed. So very fearful were they. And essentially, the burning of Falmouth uh, in Maine semi-directly led to the creation of the Continental Navy. So that is the burning of Falmouth and Mawet's Revenge, as I like to call it. I haven't ever heard anyone else call it Mawet's Revenge, but certainly seems like Mawet was getting revenge. And then went with another fire. The Great Fire of New York, as it's often called. So... So late September 1776, a few months after independence had been declared, the British had already evacuated Boston, and they were sitting out the coast of New York City. Now, suddenly, the British were landing in New York, and suddenly, a fire breaks out. Just as the Patriots are leaving and the British show up, a fire breaks out. This is a gigantic fire. Uh, burns also a quarter of the city, which in New York was about a thousand buildings. Uh, they tried to stop it at the time. They didn't have fire departments. They had, well, they had, they called them departments, but basically they had buckets that they could fill with water and throw in the fire. Uh, they would also try and knock down buildings out of the way to make sure, you know, so that the fire had nothing else to catch fire on. Uh, fortunately, there was a gigantic change of wind, and Mother Nature essentially put the fire out the following night. And if it hadn't gone out that night, New York City could have been almost completely destroyed. 
Now, there's a lot of mystery about Mr. Mystery? Mystery? There's a lot of mystery around the fire of New York because no one's really sure how it got started. There are a lot of witnesses from throughout the city that suddenly realize many fires had broken out seemingly all at once. Now, the Patriots blame the British. Look, they're invading our cities and burning them to the ground, just like at uh, Falmouth. Truthfully, that's not... The British would have had very little to gain by burning New York City. After all, they would remain in New York for the following seven years. They thought they would win the war and keep the city and wanted it to be nice. Additionally, a lot of loyalists had been, now that the British were there, were hoping to come and stay with them <laughs> in the safety of the king's might and power. The, the British blamed the Patriots. Now, George Washington had been ordered by the Continental Congress not to burn New York City upon his retreat. And as we know, George Washington almost always did exactly what the Continental Congress wanted. That being said, uh, the chances that there were some enterprising patriots who took it upon themselves to have a little conspiracy and light the fires on be behalf of the Continental Army because Congress wouldn't let them, that seems to be the most plausible scenario. Especially because uh, George Washington, looking from afar, sees the fires burning New York and says, quote, They did what we cannot do for ourselves. Yeah. So Washington obviously wanted New York to get burned, but he was following orders as a good commander-in-chief of the Continental Army should do, I suppose. Um, now, interestingly, this leaves... New York was in trouble at this point because many of the loyalists had actually left the city when the Patriots took over, when the Continental Army got there. And now, before they came back, many of the Patriots left when the British were coming in, making it even harder to actually fight the fire. Additionally, uh, uh, General Howe thought, much like Washington wanted to burn the city, Howe thought Washington was burning the city as a distraction so that if he sent soldiers to put the fire out, he thought Washington would start picking off his soldiers. Now, this wasn't the case, but you can understand why he would justifiably think that might be the case. So it took him a very long time to even order anyone to put the fire out for that reason. And New York would be pretty severely damaged for quite some time. If you ever play Assassin's Creed 3, which is a, history, a video game that kind of does American Revolution history... Uh, when you're in New York, the graphics are great. So you're walking through like old timey Philadelphia and old, old timey Boston, old timey New York. Uh, a quarter of New York is a third of New York is burnt in the game, which is a great attention to detail for that game. Uh, and that is essentially it for the fire. Uh, New York would rebuild. It would rebuild to be New York, the New York that it is. Uh, and there's that. Hey, Nick, thank you so much for coming. Let's see who's next flying through. Remember, Nick, some of these are going to be answers tomorrow at Trivia, so pay attention. Hey, TJ, how's it going? Uh, so some militiamen caused it. How long did the investigation on you started the fire? On who started? How long did the... Oh, 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 you know what? That's a good point. I forgot to mention that. Um, I don't know if it was militiamen necessarily. It might have been, it probably wasn't Continental Army because they would not have been following orders. It might have been militiamen. It might have just been Patriot sympathizers living in New York City. There's really no way to know. Uh, I, I, I will say, uh, General Howe, after the fire goes out and the Americans leave Manhattan, Howe does investigate. And he, he arrests over 100 people, but no one's ever tried for a crime. Because they had no way to prove who did it. So essentially, how he uses this as an excuse to run through the city arresting people. <laughs> um, who he suspects to be Patriot sympathizers because it must have been the Patriots, right? As for how... Hi, Mass. Thanks for coming. Uh, as for how long the investigation went, I'm not entirely sure. I think it was kind of like an ongoing investigation that whenever Hal wanted to arrest someone in Manhattan, it was a convenient reason to do so. Ann Fisher Miller. You guys ready to be sad for a little bit? Uh, Ann Fisher Miller, uh, her husband and two sons both went to war almost as soon as the revolution breaks out. Now, the Miller family lived in 
uh, Westchester, New York, just a little bit north of New York City. And there Anne stayed uh, until August of 1776, just a month after Declaration of Independence or so. She receives word that her husband, Elijah, had died in the war. Now, obviously she's very sad that her husband passed away. But then Anne Fisher Miller gets a knock on the door. As the story goes, there's a knock on the door and she opens it. And who's there? But General George Washington. Now, there's probably not exactly how it goes because it wasn't just Washington. It was Washington and the Continental Army. And uh, it's usually when you live out in the woods, if an army shows up, it, you don't just hear them knock at the door. You hear them coming. So there's probably a little bit of tall tale in that part of the story. Uh, but we do know George Washington did go to her house. And he commandeered the building in the image next to me uh, and said, we are going to use this as the headquarters for the Continental Army for a little bit. And Ann Fisher Miller uh, probably wasn't being asked if they could use her house. She was probably being told. But she seems to have been a gracious host, as Washington attested to. And in fact, this was the headquarters of the Continental Army during the Battle of White Plains. Now, like most of the battles at this point in the war, well, the Americans lost the Battle of White Plains. That being said, uh, they did inflict pretty heavy casualties and slowed the British down before retreating to New Jersey that would eventually later on in the year lead to the battles of Trenton and Princeton, which are much more famous because they were much more successful for the Americans. Now, two months after this, unfortunately, in December of 1776, Miller gets another letter. Both of her sons had gotten, had fallen ill and passed away while members of the Continental Army. So in the span of five months, Ann Fisher Miller loses her husband and both her sons and plays host of the Continental Army. But that's not it, because eventually George Washington comes back and uses Ann Fisher Miller's house as his headquarters again. In fact, Charles Lee, Horatio Gates, and Alexander McDougall were all major generals who at one point or another used her house as the headquarters of at least their segment of the Continental Army. So it must have been a nice place. Might not look like much in the picture here, but at the time, must have been, seemed like a palace, especially when so many of the soldiers were outside sleeping in tents. Now, despite her tragic losses, Anne Fisher Miller lives another 40 years after the revolution. <clears throat> when she dies during the James Monroe administration, she's 84 years old, and she has seen uh, her the nation that her husband and two sons died for uh, blossom and win the War of 1812 and find its way to the era of good feelings. So there is a bit of a happy ending there for Ann Fisher Miller. And let's see who's next. Arthur Lee. I'm going to take a quick sip of water before we carry on. Arthur Lee. So, the name Lee is pretty popular. He is a member of the Lee family of Virginia. And by the Lee family, I mean the Lee family. Uh, not only did Arthur Lee was one of at least five brothers, it was him, uh, Thomas Ludwell Lee, who was the oldest and kind of a leader of the family. Uh, Nick with a good question over here about Ann Fisher Miller before, uh, did the Continental Congress or the generals pay Ann Fisher Miller while they were using her home? Not that I know. I don't believe they would have because they were commandeering it. <laughs> um, uh, you know. I would assume that I want to say they would reimburse her for any damages, but they would have taken care of the house. It's not like they were storming around. It's not like the whole Continental Army went in. It's like George Washington would have slept in the extra room and everyone else would have had to find somewhere to go. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm sure the generals had food from the army that I'm sure they shared with her and, and things of that nature. That's usually the setup. I don't know the specifics of her scenario, but uh, from my research usually the generals take and this goes for the british and the americans if they walked into a house with a woman in it and it was just her maybe her daughters or even her you know her children they weren't gonna like beat people up like they were gentlemen they had were the highest they were literally the elite of society and they had a certain amount of honor they had to uphold in such scenarios so uh, at the very least, I'm sure they would have been as accommodating as possible. I don't know of them ever paying Ann Fisher Miller in particular. I know sometimes there were uh, a little bit of financial, you know, almost like here's 20, you know, here's 100 bucks. Thank you for the weekend kind of thing. Great questions today, Nick. 
Uh, as for Arthur Lee, his older brother, Thomas Ludwell Lee, was a big player in Mass uh, Virginia. His other brother, Richard Henry Lee, is the most famous one uh, for recommending independence and being a uh, uh, early president of the Continental Congress and that kind of thing. Uh, Francis Lightfoot Lee is another one of his brothers who also signed the Declaration of Independence. His other brother, William Lee, was an, an, a diplomat overseas, as Arthur would also be. Uh, he also had a cousin named Charles Lee, who would be attorney general under John Adams. He had another cousin named Henry, Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee, who essentially led the whisk, uh, stopped the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, <clears throat> and Rich, and Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee's son would be Robert E. Lee, famous as one of the leading generals of the Civil War. So Arthur Lee is from the Lee family. And I give you that setup because... Well, it makes a lot of sense when he goes across the sea uh, and studies in England. He first studied to become a physician, and he practices as a doctor in England for several years um, before he gets a little bit of popularity when he writes in the 1760s a paper defending the Stamp Act Congress. Uh, Stamp Act Congress, of course, met about 10 years before the Revolution, uh, filed some complaints that they mailed over the ocean to stop the Stamp Act, and it essentially worked. Arthur Lee publicly defended them. He got some popularity and some pushback, and he studied another career. He studied to be a lawyer. Well, after that happens, he is contacted and made a colonial agent for Massachusetts, which means he was the Massachusetts' representative to the crown. It's a little strange they chose a guy from Virginia to represent Massachusetts, but they did, and it wasn't uncommon. For example, Ben Franklin represented several colonies at the same time while he was over there. Oh, by the way, Arthur Lee and Ben Franklin were both there representing colonies at the same time, and they first worked together at this point, and they first start to disagree with each other at this point. Lee didn't like the lavish, hedonistic lifestyle Ben Franklin enjoyed, uh, and talked bad about him. In fact, Arthur Lee was communicating directly with Samuel Adams this whole time because Sam Adams was one of the leaders of the Massachusetts General Assembly uh, during the colonial period. Arthur Lee was their representative. So, talking a little trash about Franklin over to Arthur Lee, but uh, uh, over to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sam Adams. But luckily, Sam Adams was corresponding with Franklin as well. Once the revolution breaks out, Franklin goes back to the United States and Arthur Lee flees London, because he's obviously an American who is siding too much with the Patriots. He is a, the first person chosen to be the ambassador to both Prussia and Spain. Now, difficult to be an ambassador to both Prussia and Spain at the same time, because they're pretty far away from each other, and you were traveling by horse at best at the time. That being said, eventually he has moved over to France, where he works directly with Benjamin Franklin, who returns to Europe, and Silas Dean, who you've probably heard me speak about before. He's one of the most underappreciated American founders. He almost, the, he, Dean had been in France by himself for quite some time, working covertly with the French government to get supplies and ammunition and uniforms to America to help support the Continental Army. We would not have won the Battle of Saratoga without the French aid that Silas Dean had almost single-handedly got to America, and it is that Battle of Saratoga that helps get France over the line to win. Dean would eventually return to the United States uh, with the might of the French Navy, sitting next to the admiral, the admiral of the French Navy on one side, and the first ambassador from another nation to ever recognize the United States on his other. When he got off of this fleet of ships he brought to help, he Silas Dean expected to be greeted as a hero. He rightfully should have been greeted as a hero, but he wasn't. He was greeted with suspicion. Why? Because Arthur Lee was jealous of him. And Arthur Lee had been writing letters home to his brothers, Richard Henry and Francis Lightfoot, who I'll remind you had just signed the Declaration of Independence and were still in the Continental Congress. And Arthur Lee had literally made up lies about both Silas Dean and Ben Franklin that his brothers believed. Fortunately, this not only ruined Silas Dean's career because they say you're going to get a trial and they let Silas Dean sit around for like a year and never give him a trial. Eventually he gives up and goes home, then has to go back to Europe to 
try and recoup some of his losses because Dean had spent his entire fortune trying to win the American Revolution, unlike Arthur Lee, who kept his little fortune. Anyway, trying to stay unbiased here, though obviously it's pretty difficult. Uh, now, the Continental Congress, I will note, it was divided over this issue. The Lee family, one of the most powerful in Virginia, was kind of leading the Continental Congress at that point, and their brother had been talking so much trash about Silas Dean, but he had also talked trash about Ben Franklin. Now, no one wanted to give Franklin too much cr uh, trouble because he was the Ben Franklin, so most of it was taken out on Dean, despite the fact that eventually it was proven to be all made up. All of it. <laughs> um, because of this, Arthur Lee is eventually recalled, and he actually returns to the United States for the first time in 30 years, he hadn't been home. He comes home, he's quickly elected to the Virginia Assembly, and then almost immediately sent to the Continental Congress. Uh, so uh, he doesn't, he's not there with his brothers, he essentially replaces one of his brothers, hanging out at the Continental Congress for a little bit, and then returns home to go back to becoming a physician in Virginia. Now, he does kind of re-emerge on the political scene at one point uh, when the ratification of the Constitution is in question. He writes some pretty popular anti-federalist papers uh, and then goes back into private life and kind of disappears, not into sub obscurity, but uh, he kind of disappears because, well, he had been proven to be the wronged, not the wronged, the, ro the, 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 the bad guy in the debate with Silas Dean and Ben Franklin. So that kind of really hurts his public image after that. Uh, and that's Arthur Lee, who is a fascinating. You know, he's not the worst guy in the world. Like I said, he's one of the first ambassadors. He'd been writing a lot of important pamphlets early in the war. He was important, part of the Lee family. But Silas Dean, from my perspective, is such an American hero who is absolutely forgotten. Uh, and that is largely due to the slander and lies and rumors made up and spread by Arthur Lee. So hard to stay unbiased when I'm talking about Arthur Lee. Now we'll talk about someone a lot of fun. Prince Hall. So Prince Hall was a free black man living in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, just before the Revolutionary War broke out. And he's really the first person, one of the first people you can call an abolitionist. Now they called it manumission at the time, but the premise remains the same. Uh, Prince Hall wanted to get rid of slavery, and he was trying to figure out a way that he could help both increase the status of free black people in society and kind of push his uh, white counterparts to start liberating slaves. Now, he does this by trying to join a Freemasonry lodge. Freemasonry, for whatever conspiracy theories are out there today, in the 18th century was a very important stepping stone for many men to excel their set uh, exceed the status they had in society and become more important to their community. Hall sees this and he attempts to join a local Freemasonry organization. Now, they say, no. <laughs> um, unfortunately, for extremely racist overtones, he is not permitted to join. So what he wants to do, Hall then goes on to create his own lodge. Now, he does this because right about this time, the British have come to Massachusetts to punish them for dumping some tea in the harbor, and they are being repressed by the soldiers. Some of the soldiers in the British Army that were stationed in Boston were from Ireland, and they were super cool about it because Prince Hall became friendly with them, and they helped Hall create his own lodge because they were Masons themselves and had the power to do so. It's in this fashion that Prince Hall creates African Lodge Number 1. Now, of course, Hall, like most of the people who joined the organization, were not Africans. They were Americans. Granted, with African ancestry, for, um, at that point, pretty much 100%. Uh, but he does it nonetheless. Now, jumping ahead of his story real quick, at this point, there are dozens of Prince... The African lodges have since changed their name to Prince Hall Freemasonry, rightfully named after Mr. Hall right here. Uh, and now there are dozens of organizations like this. Over the last several centuries, hundreds of black men have joined the organization uh, and, and used it as a stepping stone to increase their position in society. Uh, and, and many Americans of all denominations owe Prince Hall a very big debt of gratitude for that. 
Now, once the war breaks out, going back to where we were, once the war breaks out in 1775, Prince Hall, despite his association with these Irishmen in the British Army, actually supports the American Revolution. Uh, he believes that if black, the free black people of Massachusetts and black people in general joined the fight with the Patriots to win the Revolutionary War, it would uh, give them a better opportunity to uh, move forward and say, hey, look, we fought for liberty. Can we have our liberty, please? Uh, and that would be a better scenario for them. Unfortunately, that largely didn't prove true in much of the United States, uh, though in places like Massachusetts, by the end of the revolution, war uh, slavery is outlawed in Massachusetts. Pennsylvania, it's, uh, it's already on its way out. New Hampshire. So to a large degree, uh, Hall and his counterparts in the North were right. Uh, and, and to be also fair to Hall, I, I don't know of him spending any time in the southern states he was probably aware of how the plantations operated there but living and being exposed to new england probably gave him a certain point of view that might be uh, a little more how do we say um he might have had more of a belief that it was possible to achieve equality living in massachusetts where as i said it happens pretty quickly uh now Prince Hall, as I said, supports the Revolutionary War, but we don't know if he actually fought in the war. He does tell his colleagues, uh, you know, the other black men of the area to fight in the war. We don't know if he fought in the war. Unfortunately, there are about a half dozen people named Prince Hall in Massachusetts who were free men of color at the time. Some of them did fight in the war and some of them didn't. And it is really hard to determine which one of these may or may not have been Prince Hall. Being said, he did support the war itself. Hall then goes on to make more of a name for himself writing and discussing uh, abolition after the war. Uh, so Hall supports what we would now call the Back to Africa movement and what at the time would eventually lead to the creation of the American Colonization Society. It was a popular idea at the time because everyone was kind of nervous about freeing the slaves and having white people and black people lived among live amongst each other they thought that could only lead to problems their idea is not mine truthfully prince hall understood this he might not have agreed with it but he understood it and he promoted the idea of starting a colony an american colony in africa which later would happen it would become a liberia the capital is monrovia it's the only capital of another nation named after an american president uh uh, I, I don't recall if he actually traveled to Africa. Um, I don't remember if he traveled to Africa. I, I don't believe he did. But uh, there, the idea was there, that we should free black people and let them travel back to Africa. This ended up in practice you know, about 30 years after Hall was promoting it, not working as well as one might hope. Uh, first of all, most people had been born, as I said, in America and had never been to Africa and moving across an ocean to a place they didn't know might not have seen appealing to them. Uh, additionally, they didn't have necessarily the best educations. Therefore, forming a whole colony would have been extremely difficult. And I'm not going to list through all the reasons, but there are many reasons, as you might imagine, that this would not work out, unfortunately. But being said, you skip 200 years later and the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, there were a lot of different ideas on how to go about things. And very interestingly, most people uh, in the civil rights movement could, in one fashion or another, another, look back to Prince Hall. You had some people uh, who were saying the best decision would be to, you know, the back to Africa movement. As I said, we should try and move back to Africa. That can be traced pretty much directly back to Hall. At the same time, there were people saying, you know, we want to get rid of separate but equal. We want to integrate into the same society. And those people could also trace their ideas back to Hall to a large degree. Other than the fact that it's fair and polite. Uh, but the idea of proving, no, black people and white people are exactly the same. We might look different, but who cares? Uh, and that was essentially what Hall was trying to prove when he created African Lodge Number 1. So I could go on about Prince Hall all day. I think we will call it there. We're going to get to our final Federalist. I mean, our final founder. I'm going to take a quick sip of water because I'm thirsty. 
Fleury Mesplay. I used to say Mesplet, but it's French. He's a Frenchman, Fleury Mesplay. It's the Frenchman who went to Canada to promote the American Revolution. Fleury Mesplay. So Fleury Mesplay, as I said, born in France, has a grows up, has a printing press. It's not doing so well. He was a very big fan of Voltaire and had very Republican ideals. And he wanted to go somewhere new and try his hand somewhere else. So he moves to London. Because, you know, you want to print French newspapers in London. Uh, to be fair, uh, France was, French was the language of international diplomacy at the time. So he would have been publishing more directly to a... Like, even the most British people who were of important to running the world could speak French. So they would have been essentially his target audience. Now... While he's there, he becomes friendly with a young man, an older man at this point, Ben Franklin. And just uh, in about 1774, it turns out the Continental Congress is meeting over in Philadelphia. I'll remind you, Ben Franklin was still in London. He had been in London for the better part of 20 years and was still there when the first Continental Congress met. It turns out the second Continental Congress is going to meet. Ben Franklin sends Fleury Mesplay to Philadelphia with a letter of introduction to the Continental Congress. And just like Franklin thought, the Continental Congress said, yeah, we can use a French printer. Come on across the ocean with your French printing press. Uh, wee oui, wee, oui, let's do this. Now, over the course of the first few years of the revolution, even before the revolution starts, the Continental Congress writes three letters to the inhabitants of Canada. They were all in French. They were all printed in pamphlets and handed out around trying to get Quebec to hop on board with the revolution. The first person they choose to print these letters in French to the people, the inhabitants of Canada, is Fleury Mesplay. Now, I do want a side note here. This is really important that they're trying to get Canada on their side. The Quebec Act was one of the intolerable acts that perpetuated the American colonies to the revolution. Also very important, uh, not only did the Quebec Act permit the people of Quebec to keep their French common laws, which many Americans did not like the idea of French common law so close to their borders, it allowed the people of Quebec to continue to be Catholic, which still pretty Puritan New England was not excited about. But, while the New England representatives are at the Continental Congress, they agree to try and get Canada on board. Uh, and it's, it's a very often overlooked but interesting first step towards what we later would learn or declare as one of the Bill of Rights, the freedom of religion. Uh, and it was, Catholics were a big part of that. Although, I always like to say, it was more like, uh, Congregationalists and Presbyterians didn't want uh, Congregationalists didn't want the Presbyterians to be in charge, and the Quakers and the Methodists didn't want anyone else in charge. Uh, and there was a bunch of, I guess, Lutheran denominations of Christianity that were afraid of each other at the time. Now, as for Fleury, he is then given a special mission. They decide to send a delegation to Canada, because just a few months later, the Continental Army has invaded Canada. And in early 1776, a delegation of Ben Franklin, who's now back in America, Samuel Chase, who would soon to sign the Declaration of Independence, would later be a justice on the Supreme Court, uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton was about to also sign the Constitution, uh, I'm sorry, the Declaration, one of the few Catholics to do so, and his cousin, John Carroll, who was soon to be the first archbishop in American history, these men are sent up to Canada to try and talk Canada into joining the fight for America. Before they go, they send Fleury Mesplay with his printing press and five carts being pulled by oxen, a, a team of five people, a bunch of carts and oxen pulling his printing press up there. They go up and he sets up a printing press in Canada. And he is paid by the Continental Congress to print pro-America propaganda in French to the people of Canada. And he does this, and he starts doing this. Eventually, the delegation does arrive. By the time that delegation catches up to him, well, the Continental Army's already in retreat, so the delegation kind of leaves pretty quick. Uh, fortunately for them, three of them signed the Declaration of Independence, so I guess that's a nice 
well, well what's the what's the phrase uh you know a nice safe school i don't know leave in the comments tell me what i'm thinking of <laughs> it's a nice fallback plan signing the declaration of independence flurry decides to stay in canada he realizes hey you know what's great is printing a printing press in a place where the readers speak my language because there weren't that many people in colonial America. Weren't that many people in London who were buying French papers. There were not nearly as many people in, in Philadelphia doing the same. Uh, in French Quebec, there was everyone. Uh, and he sets up uh, one of, if not the first French printing press in the New World. There might have been one uh, in in um, uh, uh, Quebec City. Because at this point, uh, Fleury goes to Montreal. And he's living in Montreal. That's where he sets up his printing press. But as I said, the Americans were in retreat. And right behind them was the British Army chasing them out of Canada. And they get to Montreal. And Fleury's just still there printing propaganda for the Patriots. So the British say, go to jail. Uh, and he does. He goes to jail for a month. And they're like, are you done? Done printing stuff about how good America is? And he says, uh, maybe. And they let him go. And he immediately starts printing more propaganda for the Americans, which is really nice of him. Uh, except that this time the British say, well, now we're not going to play nice. And they put him in prison for three years. Uh, he gets out just before the Revolutionary War ends. At this point, there's really no more fighting in Canada. And he seems to be all done with going to jail. So he starts a paper. Uh, he starts a paper called the Montreal Gazette. And the Montreal Gazette, 200 plus years later, is still being published today. Now, I guess we're ending with a little bit of a question mark, because Fleury might be more of a founder of Canada than a founder of the United States. But as you can tell from this particular story, it's certainly intertwined, uh, because he is one of the early major publishers in that uh, future country, at the time still a part of Britain. Although I do understand that the the chief executive of Canada is the Queen of England. Am I right? She's like still on their money up there? Anyway, I love you, Canada. Not trying to talk trash. Giving you a founder today. Fleury Mesplay. I think that's how his name is said. A fascinating, fascinating story. If you agree that, that, is, that these have been fascinating tales, do me a favor and hit like. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'm always here to hear them. And uh, I hope you're paying attention because tomorrow we play trivia at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, a lot of the questions are going to reference what we were just talking about. So I hope to see you there. And I will be back with trivia for you tomorrow.